Hi, uh, this is B. Um, hope you're all doing OK. So the work I'm going to talk about today is part of a project based in the Department of Classics at Oxford uh, called M Monumental Art of the Christian and Early Islamic East. And the project was set up by the late Judith Mackenzie to look at how uh, Greco-Roman visual traditions were adapted in late antiquity going into the early Islamic period. And my part of this was to look at the mosaics of the Great Mosque of Damascus. Uh, the mosque was built in 705 to 15 uh, on the orders of the Umayyad Caliph Al-Walid ibn Abd al-Malik. Uh, and along with the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which had been built a couple of decades earlier by Al-Walid's father, uh, the Great Mosque of Damascus is the monument for early Islamic mosaics. Um, but over the year and a half I've been on this project, I've gone increasingly off topic as I've realised just how much of the mosaic in Damascus is post Umayyad and how little these lay traditions have been studied. Uh, I'm still in the process of trying to work out what's what, what's there and what date it all is. And eventually I want this to be a book going into the social and artistic contexts for the successive editions of Mosaic. Uh, but that's way off and this is very much a work in progress. <clears throat> so for the first half of the paper, I'll run through the different phases of Mosaic as, as far as possible. And in the second half, I'll talk about one particular area, um, the one you can see in this photo, uh, uh, partly because I'm puzzled by it and want some input, and partly because I think that even if it has to remain a puzzle for now, it raises some interesting questions. Uh, the other thing is that um, shortly before the lockdown started, the project managed to buy some very high resolution photos uh, of the mosaics that were taken from scaffolding um, before the war started by by a professional photographer. Um, these allow me to see a lot more detail than I have before and I'm still trying to make sense of the new information but unfortunately I'm not allowed to show you the photos yet um, but I have drawn, done drawings from a couple of them. So I quickly introduced the mosque. Uh, it was built on the site of a church which in turn had replaced a temple of Jupiter. The church had just occupied part of the temple site and would probably have fitted comfortably inside this courtyard. The mosque fills the entire temple enclosure with a triple aisled prayer hall to the south and porticos around the, the other three sides of the courtyard. And when it was built, all the walls above the height of the piers, um, so inside the prayer hall and the porticos, on the exterior walls, even on the, um, the side of the, uh, uh, the hall facade, uh, all the soffits of arches, all the sides of the window piers, everything was covered with glass mosaic. Uh, from back of the envelope calculations, I think it would have come to about 7,500 square metres of mosaic. And the areas that survive the best are at the main entrance to the prayer hall, uh, so there, and in the west vestibule and west portico, there. Um, arches and piers are mostly decorated with acanthus scrolls and with these sort of vase, cornucopia, trumpet uh, type objects. Uh, spandrels of the arches tend to have trees on them. And the long back wall of the west portico is particularly well preserved, and this is the most studied area of the mosaics. It's often known as the Barada panel, on the assumption that the river depicted is the Barada that runs through Damascus, um, although I don't think it is. Um, and this is this image here is fairly representative of the imagery on the larger areas of wall. So there are buildings, some of them fantastic palaces or pavilions, some are clusters of smaller structures. Uh, there are trees, there are rivers, there's lots of gold background and simpler, fairly simple patterns in the borders, mostly floral or leaf like. Um, and the, the, the mosaics I've, I've just shown you are more or less from the original phase of the mosque in the early 8th century. Um, I say more or less because all of the mosaics were taken off the walls in the 1960s, uh, restored, which sometimes meant changed a little bit, and put back in almost exactly the same places. And the horizontal and vertical cracks uh, in the top of the image there are the results of this process. Um, the brighter coloured mosaic above that line um, is entirely 1960s work, filling in where patches of mosaic had been uh, lost. But ignoring the 20th century restorations, which, like I say, just affect all of the mosaic, um, this is roughly the situation. So I don't want to give the wrong impression. Um, over half of the mosaic in the mosque is from the Umayyad period. 
nonetheless, this should give you an idea of the, ex of the extent of the additions. And, and if you look at the inset of the West Vestibule, um, the kind of patchwork nature of the decoration. Uh, the mystery bit that I'm working on at the moment is that one. Uh, but I will talk about the other phases first. So the earliest edition was hardly more than 50 years after the mosque was built, when the treasury or the Beit al-Mal was added to the courtyard um, by a governor of Damascus in the 770s, in the early years of the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, the style and technique of these mosaics are very similar to the Umayyad ones. Um, there are also textual references to 9th century mosaic commissions elsewhere. Uh, so it, it looks like there was pretty much continuity of craft practice uh, well into the Abbasid period. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I've got an article about this uh, almost ready at the moment uh, and we'll send the draft to anyone who, who would like to read it. Um, the next restorations are in the northeast corner of the courtyard on, on the exterior of the portico walls. Uh, so the, the north um, the north portico wall had long running structural problems and there are inscriptions recording repairs to it in 1089, 1109, 1118 and 1159. Um, this particular section of wall in the corner was entirely rebuilt so the mosaics uh, have been added from scratch they're not they're not repairs. Um, the iconography is broadly similar to the Umayyad mosaics, but the colours um, and the manner of depicting the buildings, uh, you know, the use of the checkerboard motif, for example, um, is very different. And the artists have also added a new motif, uh, the boat on the river. Uh, the script is also a new feature, so here. Uh, it's a, a pious formula in, in the Sunni tradition, naming the prophet members of his family and the first four caliphs. Um, although there was once a big dedicatory inscription in the prayer hall, there are no surviving you know, sort of incidental inscriptions from the Umayyad mosaics. Um, Marguerite van Berkham argued that this script was later than the frame around it, um, so perhaps 12th century writing in an 11th century frame. Um, but with the exception of the script, the other reason for dating these mosaics uh, to one of the earlier of the four repairs, so between 1089 and 1118, is the difference in the level of detail uh, and the colours of the tessery between them and the patch on the adjoining wall, which is securely dated to the 1159 work. Uh, so that's um, uh, this patch. Um, so the inscription here names the Zengid ruler Nur din who sponsored restoration work on the mosque in 1159, shortly after he'd taken control of Damascus. And although the letters and the, the, the running scroll around them are done pretty neatly, the leaf and the vase forms are uh, considerably simpler than any elsewhere in the mosque. Um, on the soffits, the colours of the tessery have also faded, um, as if the pigment um, as if the pigment had only been applied to the surface of the tessery rather than the whole piece of glass being dyed. Um, and I think actually the tessery here are probably painted stone uh, with the, the, the brighter glass being reserved for the more visible facing wall. Um, and this all suggests that the 1159 editions were done by artisans without the same background of training or unable to access the same resources that the earlier teams had, or possibly both. Um, the next intervention was probably only 20 years later, uh, but in a different style again. And these are high up on the main entrance wall of the prayer hall. Uh, the large buildings in the Umayyad mosaics appear to come fairly directly from a late antique tradition of, of images of palaces and, and chiboria and shrines. But here for the first time, there's, there may be an attempt to depict a mosque um, in the arched windows uh, and in the steppe merlons, um, both of which feature in the Great Mosque of Damascus. Uh, itself. Now we, um, we know from inscriptions carved in the marble of the prayer hall that, that the marble revetment which covered the lower half of the walls was replaced in 1179 um, during the reign of Salah ad -Din. Um, There's no written record of the mosaics on the upper walls being replaced at the same time but it is plausible. 
and, and part, <coughs> partly this is because of the similarity in the depictions of the buildings uh, in the prayer hall uh, and some of the other motifs, some of the, the, the floral ones. Um, two mosaics in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which was mosaiced in 1167 uh, to, uh, to 79. Uh, so uh, I'm looking at the uh, funny shaped windows there and there and obviously the interlace. Moving into the 13th century, um, there is another fixed date for um, some mosaics provided by an inscription in the West Vestibule naming Sultan Baybars, uh, who reigned from 1260 to 1277. Um, details of the flowers and the border, the, the wavy border design in this section, um, and the house and the tree in the East Vestibule, and uh, in the, the, the buildings in a patch towards the north end of the Barada panel. Um, all these can be they're also dated to Baybar's intervention by their similarity to mosaics in his mausoleum in Damascus, which was built in 1277. Um, and the fact that these three patches are spread across the mosque um, makes me think that there were probably others. Um, the, the three areas aren't huge. They appear to be more about filling in damage than creating entire new compositions and the iconography is mostly um, again close to the 8th century mosaics cl closer than the ones I've just shown you in the prayer hall um, and, and Finbar Barry Flood has written about this in terms of a conscious revival of, of Umiyad tradition um, uh, which, which I, I think is right. So next century again uh, major additions were made to the mosaic programme in the 1320s and 30s under Tankis, the Viceroy of Damascus. Um, and this included moving one whole section of mosaic in the prayer hall from one wall to another, as well as making new batches of tessery uh, and reusing old ones. Um, not a lot of this work survives or, or not hardly any has been identified. Um, the spiky leaf shapes uh, on this patch on the treasury uh, in the courtyard have similarities with ones uh, in the mirror of a mosque founded by Tankis in Damascus um, in 1317 and with others in the mirror of the Bertasia mosque in Tripoli roughly around the same time so I'm pretty sure these belong to his um, his restorations. The ones at the south end of the west portico are not close enough uh, at all to be by the same team but there are again some similarities um, and the, the written descriptions do suggest that this was a major intervention which would have involved more than one team. Uh, so I'm really still I'm really still hunting for Tankies' mosaics in, in in around the mosque. Um, so that's the last addition to the mosaics mentioned in the written record, but there are at least a couple of other um, a couple of other ones. So these walls facing each other in the uh, the, the entrance hall uh, both have interlace, so there and there. Uh, spindly trees, there, there, and large trefoil motifs, there and there. Uh, and you're just looking at the left-hand half of the uh, the right-hand image, by the way. The right-hand half of the right-hand image is um, 8th century. Um, so I did say it was a patchwork. Um, the trefoils and interlace have some broad similarities with ones on Mamluk textiles uh, and a whole series of repairs took place in the mosque during the 15th century. Now mosaics are not mentioned as being part of them but I think it's possible that the des designs belong to one of one of those 15th century um, projects. Uh, the decoration on one pier may be even later into the Ottoman period. Um, although simplified, the tall vertical forms of the buildings, the arches with recessed tops and the finials on the domes uh, are like those found in 16th century miniature paintings. So to sum up the first half, mosaics were added in almost every century between the early 700s when the mosque was built and the late Middle Ages or possibly the early modern period. Sometimes several projects of restoration were carried out within a generation or two although it's interesting to note that there's often not a lot or no visual similarity between them. Uh, and some of the restorations would have involved several teams of mosaicists at, at once. 
None of the later compositions quite match the complexity of the Umayyad ones, when this was the flagship mosque of the entire caliphate. Um, but in terms of the standardisation of designs and the level of detail, the quality mostly stayed fairly high. And then a couple of interventions seem to have been carried out by mosaicists uh, with less practice and or working with lower quality materials. All the designs loosely follow the original formula of buildings plus plants, um, but with different approaches. Uh, sometimes, as in Baybar's restorations in the 13th century, the aim seems to have been to copy the earlier designs as closely as possible. While in the 12th century redecoration of the prayer hall, or here, uh, new compositions were preferred. Uh, one of the big points I take from all this is that the skill of mosaic working was maintained fairly continuously. Um, the consensus previously has been that the skill was lost, maybe soon after the fall of the Umayyad dynasty in the mid 8th century, uh, and then periodically revived. Um, but but as, as Benty Killerick said about artistic revivals in a completely different context of the 4th century, um, once you have enough of them strung together, it starts to look a lot like continuity. And I think we may have reached that point here. Um, nonetheless, it would have been at a low level. The numbers of other sites with mosaic after the 9th century uh, are really small, so the trade can't have supported large numbers of practitioners at once, and it probably only existed at all in the biggest cities. Um, so each time the decision was made to commission a new piece of mosaic in the mosque, it really must have been a decision. It wasn't the default option for decoration for most of the Middle Ages. Uh, and none of the later phases involved redecorating the whole mosque, either they're, they're piecemeal. So there must also have been decisions about which areas to prioritise. Uh, in each case, in each case, there will have been specific factors behind the choice of location and the composition and the style. And eventually, I hope to unpick these for the whole sequence. Um, but for the second half of this paper, I'm going to focus on the mosaics on this wall uh, and their possible context. Um, some of the areas I've mentioned in the first half have been studied already, or at least mentioned in publication before. Um, but I'm, as far as I'm aware, this one hasn't been. So starting from scratch with it, the first thing I know is that it's later than the 8th century. Um, that's because the wall was added after the first construction and decoration of the mosque had finished. Um, the wall is one of a pair, forming a right angle at the northeast corner. And the mosaic is on the south side of this wall uh, and on the soffits of its arches and windows. The other wall of the pair isn't decorated now, although it may have been once. Uh, we can see that the walls are additions from the structure, so the pier is L-shaped and the walls have just been butted up against it. Um, perhaps the top of the pier has been slightly cut back to fit the new impost blocks. Um, the arches rest on columns on both sides. Two of them are modern concrete ones now, but late 19th century photographs show all four as uh, marble columns and, and capitals. The composition of the mosaic of the Barada panel is also cut by the new wall. Uh, and so is the mosaic opposite um, opposite this on, on, on the inside of the arcade wall. Um, so like I said, it has to be later than that. OK, finding the latest possible date uh, is harder, but I think stratigraphy can help here too. So as I said, one of the patches of restoration in the 1260s or 70s under Sultan Baybars was in the Barada panel. Uh, and this patch stretches to the end wall. So the, the, the buildings I showed you earlier are just here. Um, and as you can see, this, this area roughly corresponds to the patch where the mosaic is missing on the end wall. Now, if the mystery mosaic is later than the 13th century, then this damage happened coincidentally in the same place, but without affecting the earlier mosaic in the slightest, and this seems unlikely. I think it's more likely that both walls were damaged at the same time, but you know, and, and at the same level. Um, but for whatever reason, only the Barada panel was repaired. Uh, that is, the mosaic had to have been added to the end wall already, and then damaged already before the 1260s. Um, and in this case, the best suspects for the damage are an earthquake in 1156 or seven, and a fire in 1174. Uh, so I'm, I'm placing this mosaic earlier than the mid 12th century. 
um, but probably not a lot earlier. So, uh, like I mentioned before, there were four lots of repair to the North Portico in 1089, 1109, 1118 and 1159. Um, the the pair of walls in the corner here uh, provide some extra support for the north wall, and so they make sense as part of one of these projects. A similar pair of walls was added at the northeast corner of the courtyard. So it's the northwest corner we've just been looking at. So here in the northeast, in this case, however, um, the original pier was extended into a cross shape. So it's been it's been um, built out into the aisle, and there. Uh, uh, and 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 one end one end of each wall rests on this this cross shaped pier um, rather than having columns on both sides as as they did in the northwest corner. All the capitals used in the two corners of the courtyard are are spolia, Roman or late antique. Um, two of the four are still there in the northwest corner. These ones, they're both composite um they're not the same design but um they are uh, reasonably similar to each other um whereas the capitals for the two columns in the northeast corner are corinthian um like all the ones used in the umayyad construction for the arcades around the courtyard and inside the prayer hall so basically every other capital in the mosque is more or less like this um so when the northeast pair of walls was added, an attempt was made to match the existing design to some extent. I mean, obviously not exactly, but um, but when the northwest pair of walls was added, um, care was taken to find capitals which more or less matched each other, but without reference to those in the rest of the mosque. Um, and the fact that different structural and design choices were made for the two pairs of walls suggests to me that they belong to different campaigns of work. So even though they were probably added within a couple of decades of each other. Um, now, without actually being able to go and look at the masonry, this doesn't help pin down the wall with the mosaic to one or the other date. Um, but I think what's maybe more interesting is that the decision to select the matching capitals seems to imply a concept of the space within the arched walls as self-contained in some way, you know, within the larger building, but slightly distinct from it. And the mosaic gives a similar impression of, of innovation, although mixed with tradition. The design is mostly uh, broadly comparable with the others I've shown so far. So trees on the spandrels, architectural motifs on the upper wall, a canthus scroll on the soffit of the arch and more repetitive floral designs on the soffits of the windows. But the designs show a variety of approaches to the earlier compositions. The trees closely copy the 8th century designs. Uh, there isn't the same use of the dark background to silhouette the leaves, uh, but in, in the level of detail, the number of colours used, um, the shape of the leaves, it's not that far off. Um, but then on the other hand, um, above the trees is a pattern that I've not seen before in mosaic um, you know, at all, either in this mosque or anywhere else. Um, Unfortunately, you don't get the detail in the photo I'm showing. Uh, the half finished reconstruction is is from the much higher resolution photo. Um, I suspect that the pattern has been tra transferred from another medium, um, perhaps textile, uh, perhaps inlay the use of the kind of alternating uh, black and white tessery as borders is vaguely reminiscent of, of some wooden inlays. Um, but I've not managed to find any close comparisons yet and suggestions would be very welcome. Um, but like I say, although it's it's very neatly and competently done, it, it, it's not from a known tradition of mosaic that I'm aware of. Um, then the buildings. Um, the buildings are very different in style from the ones in the earlier mosaics. And this kind of seems highlighted by the fact uh, that they've adapted one of the forms from them. So the image on the left is from the Barada panel um, that is on, on the adjoining wall to the mystery mosaic. Uh, so they both have the fluted columns. They both have gold vine scroll in between the columns. 
and they both have the two-tone uh, green panelling with scroll work above the arches. But as you can see, the later structure on, 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 on the right has been completely reimagined. The panels have been extended into walls uh, and they have an L OG shell dome or, or more likely a, um, uh, a shell niche added above. Um, a form that isn't used anywhere else in mosaics in the mosque. Um, now, I, I don't really buy the idea of mosaicists misunderstanding earlier forms. Um, I think that if they, if they decided to redesign the structure rather than copy it closely as they did with the trees, then this was probably deliberate. And adding the shell niche seems to me to convert the structure into something a lot more like a mihrab or a grave marker. Um, and there, there's an overlap because flat mihrab images were often used on gravestones. Um, uh, and there are both mihrabs and grave markers in this form in the late 11th and 12th century across the Islamic world. And the additional scalloped borders, if you can see both, both that uh, border and the green one have got scallop shapes uh, in them. Uh, that's also something found uh, in, in 11th and 12th century architecture. So, for example, here. Um, another form which may have contributed to the artist's conception of this motif stands right next to this corner of the portico. It's the treasury in the courtyard. Uh, and this isn't as much of a tangent from the previous point as you might think, because in the 12th, 13th and 14th centuries, there was a persistent belief that the treasury was a grave monument for Aisha, the Prophet Muhammad's third wife. Uh, the first writer that I know of to mention this was Ali ibn Abi Bakr al-Harawi in the 1170s, followed by Yakut al-Hamawi in the 1220s, and Ibn Kathir and Ibn Battuta in the mid 14th century. Uh, ibn Kathir refers to the treasury as the Dome of Aisha and al-Harawi and al-Hamawi called it her tomb. Um, all of the writers I've just mentioned explained that they know that this isn't true, Aisha never visited Damascus, um, but that the people of Damascus believe it. Uh, and if this was already established as urban legend in the 1170s, it probably started earlier, um, but so far I've not been able to find any more evidence. Um, Ibn Jaber, writing in the 1180s, also associated the corner inside the portico itself, so exactly where the mosaics are, with Aisha, saying that Damascenes believed that this is where she sat to read the Hadith. Uh, and this, this legend was also repeated in the 14th century by Ibn Battuta. Uh, Ibn Jaber uh, also writes that the spot in the corner of the portico is marked uh, as, as the place where Aisha sat, by a veil above and another one hanging down. Um, there are, I mean, veils could be fixed up anywhere given enough bits of string, but I think it's worth mentioning that there are grooves on all four of the impost blocks in the corner, which could have supported rails uh, for curtains to hang from. Um, so one of the questions I have really is is about what what in this sequence of events came first was the corner fitted up as some kind of memorial to Aisha uh, and the mosaic incorporated a gravestone like design for this reason uh, or did the story only attach itself to the space once it had been decorated um, I mean I, I, it may well have been easier to think of the corner as a as a place rather than a space once it had been given the architectural definition of walls. Um, uh, equally, it could be that the stories about Aisha existed already and the addition of the walls for, for completely practical structural reasons uh, gave them a focus and added to the meaning that people attributed to the decoration. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, I don't know the answer to this. The other factor in the redevelopment of this corner of the Great Mosque was the construction of a smaller mosque, the Kalasa, just to the north. Uh, this was built by Nuruddin in 1160, burnt down in the fire of 1174, 
and rebuilt by Saladin in 1179. Uh, Anne-Marie Ede has argued that it was not intended as a separate institution, but as an annex to the Great Mosque, an overflow for the growing number of worshippers. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced by, by this argument, and, and it appears that one of the entrances to the Colossa was through the north aisle of the earlier building, uh, towards the western end of the aisle. Uh, and this may in fact have been the main entrance to the new mosque as it takes the visitor past the large pool in the courtyard, so for ablutions before you go into the mosque. Um, uh, the, the plan, by the way, was drawn in the 1920s, so the, um, the octagonal basin seems to have gone by that point. Uh, and the, the, the star on the plan marks the mirab of the new mosque. Um, the other thing that's known about the rebuilt version of the Kalasa, uh, so the, the, um, the 1179 one, was that it had twisty columns, uh, which Ibn Jaber described as uh, looking like they'd been turned on a lathe. Uh, and it, it's fairly clear that what he's describing is, is, is um, this kind of thing that was common uh, in other late 12th century monuments, especially in Saladin's time uh, after victories against the Crusaders. These, these examples are all from Jerusalem. Um, and this type of column is probably also the inspiration for the interlaced pillar in the mosaics in the prayer hall, also added uh, um, during Saladin's time in the late 1170s. Um, and I, I mention all this uh, because the mystery wall really doesn't have the same aesthetic. Um, and also because it, it seems interesting that although this space was on the main route to the Kalasa Mosque, and although both the Kalasa and the prayer hall mosaics in the Great Mosque were restored by Saladin with some kind of overlaps in, in iconography, this wall wasn't touched at the same time. Uh, although uh, my uh, hypothesis is hypothesis is that it would already have been damaged in that same fire. Uh, it could this could just be a lack of resources, but that doesn't really make sense since the prayer hall mosaics were a much bigger job. Um, and this makes me wonder whether this area had been sponsored by a political rival, um, someone that the late twelfth century rulers thought best forgotten. Um, the patron of the repairs to the north wall in 1089 was Abu Said Tutush, the Seljuk Emir, and the patron in both 1109 and 1118 was Tukhtekin, uh, founder of the Burid dynasty in Damascus, which lasted for about 50 years until Nuruddin took the city in 1154. Um, so in terms of direct rivalry to Nuruddin and then Saladin, Tukhtekin is, is definitely the better contender. Um, however, the mosaics here also use um, different visual conventions from those in the northwest part of the courtyard that I showed earlier, uh, which should also belong to one of these earlier um, phases of repair. Um, so I realise I'm going around in circles with this at the moment. I can't solve it. Uh, and rather than getting too even further into speculation, I, I will stop and sum up. So the distinguished area of the mosque when it was built in the 8th century. Uh, at some point before the 1170s, the area acquired an association with Aisha, which persisted over the following two centuries. Around the same time, it also became an access route to a new mosque, which was built and then rebuilt in the latest style within a 20 year period. And somewhere within all this um, fits this mosaic and the um, the kind of redefinition in some way of this corner of the mosque as some kind of place. Um, the mosaicists were highly skilled, capable of nearly imitating Umayyad designs, but they chose to modify them and to introduce new designs, uh, like I said, including patterns perhaps taken from another medium altogether. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I've got to, so I'll stop here. Um, any suggestions about any of this, either 
political context or iconography would all be extremely welcome. Thank you. Bye.